kind of keeps the other side guessing. But I'll never forget this because the judge that tried the case, Judge Casey, we're trying the case and he's actually letting the evidence in. The evidence of what that young woman talked about tonight. The evidence of the fact that this is an unborn life. He was letting all this evidence in. And every objection that we made was sustained. And every objection that the abortion lawyers made was overruled. One of the senior Department of Justice lawyers leaned over to me and he said, you know, he's got to overturn something that we say. He's got to do that. It's going to look terrible. I said, I don't know about you, but I've been waiting for this judge for 20 years. <laughs> let him do it. <clears throat> he let the evidence in. He was a tough guy, Judge Case. Good man. Was appointed uh, to the court and was recommended by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, senator from New York. He asked tough questions of the doctors. He got angry with the lawyers when he asked this question, the judge. When you discuss the range of options with a patient, talking about the option of life versus abortion, do you describe the dismemberment procedure where the limbs are tor torn off? This, this guy answered, uh, yes, I do. And then the judge said, when you describe this, what's the reaction? He said, well, sometimes after hearing the details, the couple leaves. Then the judge asked, but you still continue with these procedures anyways. What about the fact that the unborn child, or he would say, and if you want to call it a fetus, that's fine, because all that means is unborn child. What about the fact that they could feel pain? Do you ever worry about that? He goes, I don't worry about that. That's not my job. My job is to terminate the pregnancy. On and on it went. The judge asked if there was this issue of fetal abnormalities. And he asked, and I've got the testimony right here. Are there situations where you think there's a fetal abnormality, but when you do the abortion, you find out there's absolutely not a fetal abnormality? Answer from the abortion doctor. Yes, that does happen. The judge said, well, how do you determine fetal, fetal abnormalities? What do you consider an abnormality? And they gave the list. The judge said, well, what about blindness? What if the unborn child's blind? The doctor, stone-faced, said, we don't have a test for that yet. By the way, the judge is blind. Now, can I ask you a question? I've been practicing law a pretty long time, almost 30 years. Do you think if you were the witness, the lawyer for the abortion clinic, and you knew that question was going to come up, do you think maybe you would, when talking with the physician that was going to testify, you might say, you know, if they ask you about blindness, you may want to say, do you really consider that an abnormality? But this is callous. There was another part of it. This doctor was upset that they weren't telling the women what was going to happen. Judge Casey asked, according to the affidavits I read, the fetus is still alive during this procedure. The fingers and the hands are open and closed. The doctor said, yes, they do. Were the feet moving? Judge Casey asked. Answer from the doctor. Yes, sir. Until the skull was crushed. I'm a lawyer, so I deal with evidence. When you devalue human life, the consequences are very, very The hearing got very intense at one point. And as I'm debating whether to actually give you this or not, and I probably will because I think you need to know what happens. Judge said, in English he said, he wanted to know what happened. And he said this, and I'm going to paraphrase some of this um, because it's pretty, pretty intense. The doctor said, how exactly do you crush the skull of the child? He said, well, we use this tong-like device. Judge said, kind of like um, the claws you'd use to open up a lobster claw, the tongs you use there? It was said, oh, much, much heavier than that. The judge said, um, does it ever occur to you that there might be uh, some repercussions for this? Ramifications for this? How the woman might feel when she finds out what's happened? And you know what they basically said? We don't tell them. 
So when I hear that you've got an ultrasound machine here, and I see the testimony of the young woman who talked with that child here, this is the front end. Justice Kennedy wrote that the government can use its voice and regulate procedures. That we could draw a bright line to stop infanticide. But then he said this. This was the little known aspect of this opinion. He said this. The state has an interest in ensuring so grave a choice is well informed. It is self-evident that a mother who comes to regret her choice to abort must struggle with grief, more anguish and sorrow, more profound when she learns only after, event, after the event what she once did not know. That she allowed a doctor to pierce the skull and vacuum the fast developing brain of her unborn child. A child assuming the human form. Justice Kennedy. That sentence, that paragraph, changed the entire debate. Now this is strong stuff. And I really hesitated whether to bring this up. Because I could, you know, come here and tell you this story and that story. But you're here because you care about this issue. You have to understand something. This issue of informed consent and the ultrasounds and states being allowed not only now to allow it but require it. Some states have already done that and the court said it's constitutional. Is going to change this entire debate. My brother-in-law is a radiologist. He told me um, years ago, probably 25 years ago, he said we will win the abortion debate because the technology will so unmistakably show that we're dealing with a human being. The problem is, the groups like Planned Parenthood don't care that it's a human being. So, while to that young woman that was so significantly impacted by this wonderful ministry here, she understood it. Understand something. When we were arguing the partial birth abortion case, at the district court, the woman for the National Abortion Federation was seven months pregnant herself. I said to her at one time, you know, I, try, I keep relationships with all of them. But I, we walked out once and she was needed to take a break and it was obvious that, um, you know, she was seven, eight months pregnant. I said to her, I said, this was in the hallway, I said, do you ever think for a moment that what you're doing here might be wrong? I mean, would you do this to your own unborn child at seven months? Because the doctor that was on trial does do that, would answer me. But the fact that she wouldn't answer, I think, speaks volumes. And here's the key. And I really believe, by the way, that this is the key. We're going to win this battle with people like Life Choices what you're doing right here. One woman at a time. You know, we're in a funny season in Washington right now. We're seeing the end of one administration and about to be another. Um, some people have complained, you know, lately about, oh, they're mad at President Bush for this or that. I'm going to tell you something. Roberts and Alito. You don't have to say a whole lot more. On Monday, I uh, found out that I had a uh, case-granted review for this coming term uh, at the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, but the fact is, it's a whole new world. When Justice Kennedy, for a majority of the court, wrote that opinion, and I told a lot of friends of mine that are you know, mad at this justice, don't ever count any of them out. First of all, God is in control of the universe, and certainly if the hearts of the kings are in the hand of the Lord, then I'm not worried about the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. They're not kings. They will be very important, no doubt about it. But listen, we're in, a, we're in a new era. And the debate has changed. The funny thing is, it's not funny, I mean, but the interesting thing is that you look back over this 20 years of doing these pro-life cases. I mean, more than that. Um, it was the People said, what was the most significant impact on the life issue? In all of looking back over 25 years of litigation. 
And I said, you know, it was, it was the crisis pregnancy centers like this. And it was those grandmothers. They didn't block the access to the abortion clinic. They just would kneel on the sidewalk and pray, and it drove those abortion clinics crazy. And I will never forget this. We had 1,500 people arrested in Atlanta, Georgia. 1,500. And we were trying these cases. And it, our, my theory was this. Where I was a uh, government prosecutor when I got out of law school, so I kind of know how the system works. And I said, just wear them out. So the judge said, are you ready to try 1,500, thinking we would come up with some kind of plan? I said, we're ready to go. Start them one at a time. I demanded all of them be tried separately. <laughs> it was a hot time in Atlanta. And um, we had a great judge. It was an, you know, you get these judges every once in a while. This was another good one. And um, we tried this case, and, and uh, they were trying to identify the defendant. And yeah, 1,500 people. So they're trying, and I'm objecting. And I, I am... I have a law partner that is the best at opening and closing arguments. He's Matlock. I'm the anti-Matlock. They're ready to throw me in jail by the time the case is over with. I do the appellate arguments, and I'm a stickler on the rules of evidence, and I don't give them a break. So they're trying to identify the defendant who's sitting right there. I mean, he's right on the table, but they have to go through the form, and they get the, the police officer on there. He can't remember 1,500 people, but, he, you know, they're trying, and this piece of evidence goes in, and... I see in the corner of my eye this little yellow sticky tab thing. Like a post-it note. You gotta, you're a trial lawyer, you gotta make decisions right in the spot. My partners, don't you think you should object? Say, ah, wait a minute. He's, you know, so they're saying, they're going through the question and the prosecutor says, can you identify, officer, the defendant? And he goes, yes, the defendant is sitting right here at this table. Points to him. I said, judge, can I approach the bench? I says, sure. I said, can I see that little picture? And the picture had a note on it, all right. It said, this is the defendant. <laughs> this was about case, probably had tried about eight of them so far that day. There was about 1,492 to go. The judge turned to the solicitor general for the state and said, you know, um, what are we going to do here? Of course, I moved to dismiss, and he goes, why don't we just get rid of all of these cases, the judge said. And the solicitor grudgingly says, okay, and the judge turns to the solicitor and said, Johnny, what'd you learn today? And before Johnny could answer, the judge said, I'll tell you what you learned today, Johnny. You can't save a sinking battleship with a pair of water wings. <laughs> so occasionally, we get those judges. Occasionally. That Judge Casey from New York, by the way, actually came to the Supreme Court argument when we made the arguments to the Supreme Court of the United States, the district court judge, with the seeing eye dog sitting there to hear the arguments. And six weeks before the decision came out in our favor, Judge Casey went home to be with the Lord. But I'm telling you something. People said, where did that judge come from? I said, I waited for that judge for 20 years. And I waited for that judge in Atlanta for 20 years. And you know what? When you see the testimony that you saw tonight, right here, wouldn't it be worth it? Wouldn't it be worth it just for that one moment with that three-month-old? If that was all that was accomplished, wouldn't it be worth it? But you know what? It would have been worth it if that child had spina bifida. Because... Um, when they were trying this case, they talked about fetal abnormalities. Let me tell you what I did. Because, you know, I'm a trial lawyer, too. I mean, I do a lot. I like the Supreme Court stuff, but I do a pretty fair amount of trial work. And they, they were talking about fetal abnormalities, and hydrocephalus is, of course, one of them. It's water on the brain. Guy that runs our uh, Internet. It's in our Internet group. Has hydrocephalus. Water on the brain. It's also in a wheelchair. I had him come to the trial. He wanted to come. I wanted to see that doctor say while he's sitting there in that wheelchair I wanted him to, I want that doctor under oath to say that life is not worth saving while they're sitting there in that wheelchair is this a life worthy of life here's the scary part the callous indifference of these doctors if you read the rest of this notebook, 
would be something you couldn't even believe. Thanks for watching this special program. There's a number on your screen. I want to encourage you to call today. It is absolutely outrageous that Planned Parenthood is getting $265 million, $1.5 billion of my money and your money to fund their abortion agenda. But that's exactly what's happening, and we need to get it to stop. Here's what you do. We need to defund Planned Parenthood. We want you to sign a petition supporting the defunding of Planned Parenthood. There's a number on your screen. We need your help. 877-989-2255 to defund Planned Parenthood. Look, folks, across the street from me right now is the Supreme Court of the United States, one block from the Capitol. Congress authorized this money. Then Planned Parenthood takes the money, our taxpayer dollars, then goes to the Supreme Court of the United States to challenge the ban on partial birth abortion. We need to see Planned Parenthood be funded. You call the number on the screen, 877-989-2255. That's 877-989-2255. Somebody asked me, and I know this is not politically correct, they said, how could Nazi Germany happen? And it was awful, and it's really awful if you had 200 relatives and you go to your family cemetery, and right there in the cemetery it lists all 187 members of my family that died in Auschwitz because they were Jews. That was the crime. But how could they do it? Well, how can we do it now? The encouraging thing where I'm really excited. When I read that opinion of the Supreme Court of the United States and talking about informed consent and letting the women know the consequences of this and letting the woman know, here's the status of your child, I knew that what my brother-in-law said 25 years ago was going to happen before ours. It is revolutionizing, completely changing this entire debate. You realize that. The entire debate on the life issue is changing because of what you're doing right here. Because every child that is saved, every woman that is saved from the pain is a testament to the power and the grace of God. You know, the reality is this. I mean, you know, someone was asked once to prove the existence of God. And the response from the theologian was, the Jew. And the guy said, what do you mean? He said, there was a group of people that without the existence of God would not exist. Because look at what was going on around them. Our culture was, is not that much different. Because every culture has the propensity to do evil. That's what we believe. I mean... Without the saving grace of Jesus, I mean, let's be realistic. Man is capable of doing really horrible things to the least of these. But I don't think it's any accident that when Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, you're doing unto me, or suffer not the little children unto me, and that we're to come to him as a little child, it makes perfect sense. And I can tell you also, that so many people that I know, just like Ben mentioned, that were going to either go into the abortion clinic and have the abortion, but they went to the alternative just to get the ultrasound. They're, not, they're going to have the abortion, but they just wanted the ultrasound. And they see that child at 11 weeks. And that's all it takes. And when Bill Skelton told me that uh, 65 women came to the Lord through this facility at Life Choices, I mean, it isn't, this is what it's about. We talk about a gospel of life, but we don't separate it from the gospel of eternal life. It's all part and parcel of the same message. What I'm so encouraged about, the reason that I came from uh, Virginia today, all the way here, four days after the Supreme Court said they're granting review on a case, and I've got to go back tonight and be working on that case this weekend, argued in November, but the briefs are due. The reason I did it, because there's nothing more important than...